Good evening, church. Turn with me, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1 uh, as we continue on through this series <clears throat> called the Supremacy, Christ, the Supremacy of Christ and the Sufficiency of the Gospel. Man, excuse me, my mouth is moving really fast. Um, we find ourselves in one of the absolutely, it's one of the most beautiful passages you will find anywhere in Scripture. Um, in fact, um, it is hard for me to overstate the truth that we find in our passage tonight. Um, I had a conversation with Floyd just last Wednesday about how Colossians is arguably my favorite book of the Bible, and um, I have to tell you that this text that we're going to read this evening probably stirs my heart and my affections for God more than any other passage. And so um, I'm just telling you that because as we look at these nine verses, I want to show to you something that should be self-evident, <laughs> should be self-evident, but it's a reminder that the anchor of the Christian faith is Christ. That's it. It's the end of story. The anchor of the Christian faith is Christ, and Christ is supreme over all things. So that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. So if you would stand with me, uh, we're just going to read verses 15 through 20 tonight. Uh, next week, we'll pick up sort of in part two of what this mean, what that means for us a little bit more next week as we look at 21 through 23. But tonight, we're going to focus on verses 15 through 20. So uh, hear the word of the Lord. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, guide us to your heart tonight. We come before you humbly recognizing uh, your majesty and um, God, we come humbly also recognizing that oftentimes we forget to live in awe and wonder of your majesty. So, Father, would you, would you guide us tonight to truth? Would you help us to seek Christ for who he is and not who we think he is? I ask you to be with us and guide our hearts to truth. By the power of your spirit, I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. As a pastor... As a pastor, I often find myself what's asking the question, what sustains a Christian? What sustains us as Christians? How do we get through each and every day? And it's a, it's a question based far more in what matters most to us as a Christian. Um, what gets us out of bed in the morning and carries us through our day? What inspires us to live a righteous life? What comforts our hearts when we're discouraged or when we have fears? Um, what brings us back here <laughs> each and every Sunday morning and Wednesday night? Why do we keep coming here? Um, and beneath all of those questions lies one more. I mean, it takes a little digging, but at the base of all of, at the base of, all of those questions, you've perhaps heard of the five whys Right, like you give an answer, and then the next question is, "Well, why? Well, well, why? Well, well, why? Well, the question that lies beneath all of these questions, right, is to what should believers anchor their faith? I hope to answer that question for you tonight. In his book, Captivated by Christ, Richard Chin uh, recounts the story of uh, he went to his barbers. It was real, really funny. His, one, of, one of the people that works at his barber shop is actually also trains professional boxers. And he had gone to Australia for a while to do some training with this guy. And then he came back. And when he came back, Richard walked in and sat down in his chair. And he was showing him this tattoo that he got that took 15 hours 
of pain over the court, not, not in one sitting, mind you, over a course of time to get this thing done while he was in Australia, and he was so proud of it, and it was an image of Jesus. And Chin asked his barber, who was nicknamed Nudge, he said, why did you want a picture of Jesus inked permanently onto your body? To which he replied, I like the idea of a man who suffered for doing good. And then Chin commented, not to Nudge, but to himself, he says, even though Nudge is not yet living for Jesus as his Lord, Jesus' reputation is enough to attract him. And I don't know if you know this or not, but it is in fact easy to find Jesus attractive. It is easy to find Jesus compelling. It is easy to find Jesus appealing. In fact, there are many out there who believe Jesus was any number of great things, a great teacher, a great leader, a great uh, person, a caregiver, a servant, all of these things. A lot of people find Jesus interesting. Gandhi is quoted as saying that Jesus was one of the greatest teachers of mankind. Furthermore, Gandhi also claimed that he liked our Christ. And across the spectrum, Jesus is both a well-known figure. He is, of course, the central figure of, if, I don't know if you know this, the largest religion in the world is Christianity. Two and, two, uh, 2.4 billion people around the world claim to be Christian. That's more than anyone else. So he's a well-known figure, but he's also, he's also a worn-out stereotype. He's friendly Jesus. He's smiling Jesus. He's peaceful Jesus. He's the suffering Jesus. He's the non-judgy Jesus. He's the warrior Jesus, the anti-establishment Jesus, the anti-elite Jesus, the compassionate Jesus, the co-pilot Jesus, the leader Jesus, the religious revolutionary Jesus, the truth-telling Jesus, the foot-washing Jesus, the righteously angry Jesus, the loving Jesus and the gentle Jesus. People are smitten with Jesus for any number of reasons. But none of those reasons, none of those reasons are what the gospel rests on. Even if you combined all of them, they're not what the gospel rests on. See, people are smitten with Jesus because they have this deep need for something, and what that something is varies for everyone, and I can't tell you what it is. For Nudge, it was perhaps the idea that a man chose to stand up, was, stand up for what was right regardless of what it cost him. Maybe that flowed out of, place, out of a place in him of seeing men and women of low integrity or people who sold out or who chose to ignore the suffering of others for the sake of their own comfort. I don't really know. What, what I do know, what I do know is that the gospel is the gospel because it rests on the true nature of who Jesus is. And as we look at these nine verses tonight, actually it's less than that, it's, Six verses. Sorry, I originally was going to go through 23 and then I decided I was going to stop. So we look at these six verses tonight. I want to highlight for you the supremacy of Christ by drawing out from Paul's words three first order natures of Christ. Okay? Important, hugely massive things. Number one, Jesus is the creator. Number two, Jesus is the sustainer. Number three, Jesus is the redeemer. The creator, the sustainer, the redeemer. Let's walk through the passage together and see what we see. Let's first, let's look at this idea of Christ, the creator. 15 and 16 give us a pretty clear declaration, right? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions. So let's just start with verse 15 where he says, He is the image of the invisible God, right? That's very much so the same language that the author of Hebrews uses, the very same picture that John uses. The author of Hebrews writes that the radiance of God's glory, or that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. And the apostle John writes that no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He was, reve or he was revealed in him. So that we saw Jesus, we saw God. Right? So you have this idea of he is 
who he says he is. James, Peter, and John saw Jesus transfigured at Mount Tabor. And here, Paul writes that Jesus is the word made flesh, Emmanuel God, the one that came near, who drew near to man. And there's a lot of speculation, right? I'm going to keep bringing this up over and over and over again because I want you to understand the context that this letter is written in. There's a lot of speculation about what this Colossian heresy is. Historians don't even have a consensus about it. You read three or four different commentaries and you get three or four different answers and they all go, any one of these could be right. But there is a consistent thread that runs through first century Christianity, and it's called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is this idea that there's some kind of hidden knowledge, something that only the privileged few get to understand. But deeply embedded in that Gnosticism are a few different heresies that come out over the years. One is possibly that Jesus was just a man who had special favor from God that was bestowed upon him at his baptism. That Jesus was not, in fact, divine at all. That he was just a dude. Then there's the idea that God was, or that Jesus was not fully God. That, that he wasn't, you know, like we, we talk about this hypost- oh, it's a theological term, hypostatic union. Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. That's 200%. That doesn't make any sense, right? Well, it's like very confusing. I get it. But there are some people that think that he was only partially God while he was a man that he kind of gave up his deity and that he wasn't at all fully God. Then there's people who say he wasn't really fully man. Then there are people that say he wasn't an actual physical person, but a spiritual being. All of these are heresies that are coming out, but regardless of which form this Gnosticism was taking here in this context, the statement about Jesus that Paul makes, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, is a direct refutation of any of those ideas. Paul wants the Colossians to know exactly who Jesus is. He is God incarnate. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is the firstborn. And this is why some people will go, well, this is, a her- this is where the heresy comes from. Well, the idea that he's firstborn gives you this idea that he's a created being, that at some point he was not born. But he became the firstborn, except for that Jewish history tells us a completely different story. Kent Hughes comments, while firstborn can mean first child, it is very often simply a term that means first in rank or honor. Sometimes the Torah was called firstborn to indicate its its elevated rank. Firstborn was a code word for the coming Messiah, as in Psalm 89, 27, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the of the kings of the earth. The people of Israel as a whole were sometimes called firstborn to indicate their high position as recipients of the Father's love. So when Paul called Christ the firstborn of all creation, he meant the highest honor belongs to him, that Christ is completely supreme in creation. So we have this Jesus, this Messiah, the Christ, elevated to highest authority, the highest place of honor. And then we find this amazing illustrative information. Okay? Okay. Everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. John chapter 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created in him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. It's like the exact same language. So scripture affirms scripture, but what we see here in Colossians is the same aspect of the triune God's creative aspect, creative impulse that Paul highlights when he's talking to the people at Mars Hill, the Areopagus, and he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. It's not just that everything was made through the firstborn either. Notice that last phrase in verse 16. <clears throat> All things have been created through him and for him, for him. Brings echoes of Paul's teaching in other letters, specifically to Rome, comes to mind in chapter 11, verse 36, Paul writes, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, amen. See, Jesus Jesus is the firstborn. He is preeminent before all things in both age and rank. 
Jesus is the creator. He's the one who put all of it together. And think about that for a moment. If you've been on the internet in the last month, you may have seen pictures that have come from the James Webb Telescope. I don't know if you've seen these things online or not, but it's more powerful than the Hubble Telescope and shows us pictures of deep parts of the universe that we really have never seen before, and it is majestic. It is absolutely awe-inspiring to consider This telescope is sending us breathtaking and captivating images of galaxies across the universe on the other side of everything. And as amazing as that is, as big and expansive as that is, consider this as well. God created the atoms that are in your body. And you know what they say about atoms, right? Don't trust them because they make up everything. But you have this macrocosm of the universe and the microcosm of an atom. And it's mind-blowing. And then you can even drill that down even further and consider this. Do you know that a single strand of DNA is over five feet long? And every single one of the cells in your body contains your DNA? Can you imagine what mind could can create that? And Paul writes that it's not just by Christ's hands, but for Christ's glory. And so that should change our understanding of this world. Christ didn't just create randomly and walk away. We'll come back to that in just a second. He created for himself to be glorified. Our gaze should shift when we hear that from what we get out of from what we get out of our life to figuring out what it is that Christ gets out of our life. It's entirely from him and for him. Philippians 2 tells us that one day every knee will bow and tongue confess on the earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everything begins with him and it ends with him. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And as such, Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, immediately following the declaration that all things are from him and through him and to him, he says this. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and this is your true worship. Folks, lift your eyes to see that Christ's supremacy begins with the fact that he is the creator of all things. And then live remembering that everything is for Christ's glory. He is the firstborn. He is the authority. He's the one in charge of all of it. And he created all of it so he could be over all of it. And he does more than just create it. He sustains it. Look at verse 17. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He holds all things together. Now, this is really hard to comprehend for me. Right? This is just super hard for me to understand. Because my brain is finite. I am not an infinite person. I only have so much wisdom and only so much understanding. So I hope that it's enough. But this statement can fly right past you without really considering what it means and what it gets at. Stephen Wellam, theologian, wrote a book called The Person of Christ. He comments, the middle line, and in him all things hold together, actually looks both directions, from what came directly before it to what comes directly after it. As it presents Jesus as Lord, because of who he has always been as the divine Son, And because of what he does now as the incarnate son. Specifically, 117 teaches the son's pre-existence and supremacy over the entire universe as its creator and providential Lord. What does that even mean? I read that and I went, wow, that's deep. Like, way down there deep. And then I read something that was a little bit easier to understand. Douglas Moo, who's a professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago, wrote this writes that the universe owes its continuing coherence 
to Christ. What holds the universe together is not an idea or a virtue, but a person, the resurrected Christ. Without him, electrons would not continue to circle nuclei, gravity would cease to work, and the planets would not stay in their orbits. Without Christ, that's what would happen. Now that, that's a tough one to wrap your head around. (laughs) I fully admit that. And I I have to admit, it sounds a little sketchy. (laughs) Not because I don't believe what this says, but because my humanity says that's awfully big. And I can't quite figure that one out. But here is something I do believe and something I know to be true and that there is a direction and a course that our world is on. One which finds its beginning in Christ, the firstborn, the one who was with God in the beginning, right? And the one through whom all things that have been created were created. And that course has an end. And where does it end? With Christ. Let's remind ourselves, right? God created the world in six days, and it wasn't just good. It was very good. It was exactly what he wanted to create, perfect in design and implementation. And in his grace, he created a special creation and gave them a special task. And the special creation was made in his own image to rule and reign over what his hands and words had wrought. And that special creation was mankind. Mankind, deceived by the desire to self-govern, rebelled against God's command And as such, sin entered the world in the garden and things started falling apart. The ground was cursed. Mankind was cursed. Everything was cursed. And for millennia, it continued that way. Mankind lived with the consequences of the fall. And then God, when the time was right, sent his son into the the world to be born under the law so that he might redeem those from it. And his name was Jesus And he was born of a virgin, and he redeemed everything by living a life of perfect obedience to God's will and plan, and then choosing to be numbered among the transgressors, took on the sins of the world, past, present, and future, upon himself, and died the death of a sinner. But that's not the end of the story, right? The story continues. Then after three days, God raised his perfectly obedient son from the dead so that those who would put their faith in his propitiation for their sins would be forgiven their debt to death and so be brought back into a right relationship with him. And now, now we're waiting for the day when eternity will actually begin. It's coming. But we're not there yet. So what keeps us on the tracks? What keeps the world on the tracks? It's Christ behind everything, moving things toward that day. That's what Paul is saying here. This is the message Paul delivers. It is Christ who holds it all together for us until the day when everything is made new. He created it. It is for him, and so he sustains it. He keeps it moving how it should. And this is honestly perhaps the greatest mystery to me about this passage. Because I can either trust that God knows what he's doing and that everything happens here is moving us to see his glory. Or I can reject that. But if I reject that, even a sliver of that, I am now making God less powerful, less glorious, and less sovereign than he actually is. So when we talk about Christ holding all things together, Christ is either the master of everything or he is the master of nothing. There is no middle ground. Kent Hughes again, he is the firstborn and thus has the highest place. He is the creator of everything, every cosmic speck, every spirit. He is the goal and all creation is moving toward him and for him. He is the sustainer. He is holding the very breath that falls on these pages. What a stunning revelation this is. It is meant to stretch our puny minds. I told you, it's a mind blower, right? It's meant to stretch our puny minds and dominate our thinking and change us. When we truly understand what is being said here, it is amazing that we should ever look anywhere else for meaning and purpose in life. Since he is the creator who holds all things together, he knows how best to fix and order our lives. Folks, our approach to God must come from a place of remembering that he is both the creator of all things and the sustainer of all things. 
Because if he isn't the sustainer of all things, why would you go to him in the first place? See, we gather together for prayer on Wednesdays. I know it's mostly a teaching time now, but we still, we still do pray. We intercede. We do all of that. We come to God because God commands us to pray, but also we know that he is the one who is effective and powerful and able to change hearts and circumstances. Things that we cannot do, he can. Why? Because he is the sustainer. He's the one who holds it all together. He's the one who has the power to do the unthinkable, not just in the six days of creation, but in the day-to-day of our lives. Christ is the sustainer. He holds all things together, and he holds all things together because he has redeemed them. If all things are from, through, and to him, he had to have a plan to make them right. Because if we tried to return to Jesus and return to God, without that, we would be obliterated. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything, right? In verse 18, Paul circles back and reminds the Colossians about this concept of being firstborn. But this time, this time, he puts it not just over creation, but he goes very specific about the church. And why is that important? And that's important because it is through Christ that God creates the church. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So God redeems everything through Jesus. You know John 3.16, right? You guys know John 3.16. For God so loved me that he gave his one and only son. No, that's not what it says. For God so loved the world... The word there is cosmos. That the Greek there means everything in the created order. So everything from that exploded out macro size universe that we're talking about to that five feet of DNA that rests in every single cell of someone who's only five feet. I don't, I just can't even, like it just doesn't even make sense to me. God loves his creation, and he loves it more than you or I could ever possibly imagine because he's the one who created every peak, every valley, every proton, every neutron, every electron. And when he made it all, he found it good, perfect to what he wanted to design. And he is grieved that sin marred not just the image of man, but all of creation, and so he gives us Christ to redeem us, to redeem all of it by his death. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether the things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You know what everything means, right? Everything. And just so there's no confusion, the Greek word is pas, P-A-S which according to Strong's Concordance means each, every, any, all, the whole, everyone, all things. Don't be fooled (laughs) when it says that through him to reconcile everything to himself, it's not a small sliver. He's talking about everything, everything. Christ creates all things. Christ sustains all things. Christ redeems all all things. He is the reason for all of it. So can you begin to see why Jesus is supreme? Why the supremacy of Christ matters? Because if Jesus is less than any of those things, the gospel that we believe or that we put our faith in might not be a real true gospel. If we look to be sustained by the character of Jesus, that can be helpful, but it's still going to fall short. The character of Jesus is how his nature plays out in our lives and in what we see in Scripture. The first order things about Jesus that matter are that he is the creator, that he is the sustainer, that he is the redeemer, that all things are from, are from him and through him and to him. All of those things. It's really interesting because when I consider that, 
And I begin thinking about my own life, and I think about what it is that I find attractive about Jesus. It's not always these things. But the hope of the gospel is that Jesus is these things. So let's anchor our faith to these truths about who Jesus is. These first order natures of his, so to speak. Let me close with uh, just this thought. Richard Chin follows up this interaction with Nudge, right, in his book, Captivated by Christ. He follows it up with this. He says, it's easy to be impressed or fascinated by Jesus. Who could look at this man, the most extraordinary life ever lived, and not find something compelling? Yet, it's entirely possible to be fascinated or impressed or even compelled by Jesus and yet still have a distorted view of him. It's not enough to be interested in a Jesus of our own making. We need to have a faith in the real Jesus, the Jesus of the biblical gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for revealing in your word who you are, how you created the world, why you created the world. Father, how you are continuing, even at this time when things seem to be spiraling out of control, how you continue to hold things together. Lord, it is a great mystery. Father, help us to trust. Help us to see everything in the way that we um, help us to color everything and the way we think with these words from your word about who you are. Help us come, help us come to you when, um, with hearts that are just captivated and focused by the fact that you're the creator of all things and you are the sustainer of all things and that you are the redeemer of all things. Father, not so that our lives could be easier or better, but so that your name and your fame would spread over the earth. God, help us to look for the real Jesus and help us to testify to the real Jesus in everything that we do. I ask this in the name, in the name of Jesus. Amen.